Do you find yourself overwhelmed by the thought of making a career transition? I've been there and I understand the challenges you face. That's why I created the Career Compass, the ultimate guide for high achieving corporate women to make career transitions with ease. The Career Compass breaks down the decision-making process into five clear steps, helping you make savvy, empowered career decisions. Head over to karenfreeland.com forward slash career hyphen compass right now and download this invaluable resource. It's completely free and will get you on the path to a more fulfilling career. Go to karenfreeland.com forward slash career hyphen compass now. Welcome to Rock Your Reinvention, where I help high-achieving career women like you get unstuck, make your corporate exit strategy, and successfully transition to your next chapter. Hi, I'm your host, Karen Freeland, a certified life coach and corporate exit strategist. Whether you want to start a business, become a speaker, or something else, I'm here to give you the tools and strategies to shift your mindset, build your confidence, and take bold actions so you can rock your reinvention. Ready? Let's go. Hello, ladies, and welcome back to another episode of Rock Your Reinvention. I am so excited for today's guest and for our chat because we're going to be talking about one of my favorite things, which is money. And believe it or not, this is one of the biggest objections I get from women who want to leave, but they just don't feel like they can because They've got scarcity mentality. They don't feel like they understand their finances or have it all together. So we've got the amazing Anna Walford. She is going to walk us through some options. Tell us what we need to know so that we can make financial decisions from a place of power and abundance and bust any of those myths that might be still holding you back. So welcome to the show, Anna. Thanks, Karen. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, thank you for being here too, because you have a wealth of knowledge. And I feel like this is just an area that if you don't live it and breathe it every day, it feels a little scary for people. You know, they're like, I want to invest, but I don't know how. I don't know the tools. And I've mentioned this to you before. Some of us are familiar with Bernie Madoff, and we're like scared that somebody's going to take all of our money and run. So some of us don't make investments out of fear and and a lot of things might be holding them back. So before we dive into all the questions that I have for you today, can you just do a quick intro and let us know who you are, what you do, and maybe share a fun fact? Yeah, absolutely. My name is Anna Wolford. I'm an associate advisor at Parallel Financial, which is located here in the upstate of South Carolina. We're an independent registered investment advisor, and I'm a certified financial planner practitioner. I help business owners, professionals, retirees, and their families make great financial decisions through a holistic planning process. Okay. Love it. Thank you. And can you just tell me a little bit more about what you mean when you say holistic planning process? Yes. So when we say holistic planning, it's not just, oh, we looked at the budget and we set up a saving schedule and that's it. We're getting into everything. We want to know about your disability insurance. Do you have adequate life insurance? Are you saving for your goals in us? And what kind of investment vehicles are appropriate for you to help you get to those goals? So really holistically taking a look at every aspect of your financial life and then implementing any changes that need to be made to get you there. Yeah, that's key. I love that. I feel like you want your financial planner to be your best friend. (laughs) You want them to know everything that's going on in your life so that they can really give you the best guidance and advice. Yeah. And that's our goal. I mean, we we try to work with people who think like us, but we want to work with other people who are ambitious and are excited about their futures. And we want them to get on board with the planning process and teach them as we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that too, because I am a little bit of a learner. Like, I don't want to know everything, but I want to know enough to be dangerous. And so that I feel like I do have a pulse on what's happening with my money and I can have more educated conversations with my advisor to say, hey, well, what do you think about this? Or I've heard about this investment strategy. So I love that you're not just like, here, give me all your stuff. I'm not going to tell you what I'm doing. You're like, no, no, if you want to learn, I'm going to help you and educate you along the way. Yeah, those are my favorite clients to work with. And there are definitely people who are like, I don't get this. I don't want to deal with it. I want someone else to handle everything for me. 
And that's fine. But it is more engaging for me when the clients are like, well, can you teach me about how this works? Or why are we going to do it this way and not that way? That's really gratifying to get to have those interactions. Oh, I bet. All right. So money, from my experience, seems to elicit very strong feelings for a lot of women. And I know you like to think of money as something that is morally neutral. So can you share more about what that means and why that is such an important perspective? Absolutely. Money is emotional. And I did not coin the phrase morally neutral. That comes from a really great author and TikTok creator named Casey Davis. She wrote a great book called How to Keep House While Drowning. And in that book, she talks about things that you do to maintain your environment and keep up your home as care tasks. And so it's things that you do to take care of yourself. And then the tasks themselves, like let's say you have to do the dishes. Well, dishes are morally neutral in that having a sink full of dirty dishes doesn't make you a bad person. It just means that you fed your family today and now there's something that you need to do to clean up so that you can do it again tomorrow. And so I like to think that money falls under the category of things that are morally neutral because having money doesn't make you good and it doesn't make you bad. And wanting to seek wealth, that's not a bad thing. That's a great mindset to have. Yeah. And I know a lot of us grew up with old money mindsets like money is the root of all evil. And while there are definitely some people who have used money in unethical ways that could be considered evil, there's so many people who have millions of dollars and they are doing amazing things with it. Charity, giving back. I mean, money in and of itself. Yeah. Morally neutral. I love that perspective. Just a tool. And so it's just figuring out how to use it the right way. And that's something that I help people with. Yeah, it is a tool. It's like, would you call a hammer? Like people who have hammers are bad because they build things. It's like when you really start to dissect it and think about it this way, it starts to really break down, I think, some of those old thoughts that might be implanted in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I have experienced is that a lot of my clients want to leave corporate, but they feel like, oh, they got those pesky old golden handcuffs on and, you know, they're afraid to walk away. So what do you, I guess there's a couple of things that I want to explore. First of all, is there a right amount of money to have in the bank? Like if you want to make this leap, are you like, okay, You got to have this amount of money before you can do it. And if so, how do you determine what that number is? Yeah, I mean, that's not a one size fits all kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There's a different number for everybody. And the biggest factor in determining what that number is, is your own mindset and what motivates you individually. So let's say someone is working with you, which they should be on planning their corporate exit. And you know that this person, if they have the room to be too comfortable for too long, they're not going to do what they need to do to rock their reinvention and get out and reinvent themselves. If you have too much money in savings and you have too much cushion, you might not feel that motivation to get out and do what you need to do to start growing your own business. On the one hand, yeah, you do need cash savings because you still have to get through life. You have to keep the status quo in your household. But let's say you set a goal for 12 months from your exit to when you're going to be working full time in your new business. Well, you're probably going to work a lot harder in that second six months than you are in the first six months. And if you have too much cash sitting on the side, one, it's not efficient to sit on cash. You're losing purchasing power thanks to inflation the whole time you're sitting on it. But second, you're not creating the scarcity mindset that will help you cultivate abundance in the future. Yeah. So I am so glad you brought up this whole idea of sitting on cash because I know that I work with a lot of women who have experienced true poverty, like didn't know if their parents could turn on the lights, you know, or they were going to lose their car or different things. And now that they are very successful financially, they are just sitting on gobs of cash because they're so afraid that this is they're going to it's going to something's going to crumble. The shoe's going to drop and they're going to go back to this way of living. 
which of course the chances of that happening are like 0.0001. But because of that, they're just sitting on this cash. And I know even I had some of that scarcity for a long time. I was sitting on almost 100K just in a normal savings account. And when I think back, I would love to just uh, shake myself because so much money that that could have been earning for me, even in CDs, even in something like really low risk, and that would have just made my exit timing even sooner. I could have left even sooner. Yeah, a lot of people have that mentality, and it's really common for people to be sitting on too much cash. And, you know, kind of blanket advice is, you know, if you have two incomes in your household, then you want to be somewhere around three months worth of living expenses set aside. If you're a single income household, then more like six months expenses set aside. The reality is that people have different risk tolerances for how much cash buffer they need to have. And so for some people, that number is a little bit higher. And I've heard it called the because number. I have this much cash because it makes me feel better, because I might need to do a remodel, because this, that, or the other. Right. So part of the job that I do in coaching my clients is determining what is an okay because number and what is inefficient. Yes. And this is why you've got to have guidance and not try to go it alone because you need that third party who can just look at your situation very objectively without all of your preconceived notions and your biases and your limiting beliefs. Right. And they can just come in and you can look at somebody's portfolio and be like, oh, I hear you, sister. But even if we took X amount out of your cash, you would still be above the average. Like you're fine. And you need that sometimes. Yep. That's another case where it's just every person is unique and different and motivated different ways and has different intrinsic values. And so you have to take a really personalized approach when you're dealing with these kinds of things. Yeah. And this just really speaks to that relationship between fear and money. And, you know, we said it a minute ago, this idea of a scarcity mindset versus an abundance mindset. So how does this play out and influence a lot of your clients' behaviors besides just sitting on too much cash? Yeah. One thing that we try to do is I do try to cultivate a scarcity mindset with clients because let's say they finally hit that point in their career where they're making really good money. We want to avoid that tendency for lifestyle creep to happen. Like I'm making more, so now I'm spending more. Mm. So. Try to create scarcity. Like, let's say, hey, you don't need to have more than X amount in your checking account at the end of every month to cover all your bills. So we like to try to automate where we can and say, well, this much automatically is going to get invested every month. So you don't see some big number in your checking or your savings account and think, oh, well, I have this. I could just go spend it. You feel like there's scarcity because you're paying yourself first. And getting through that, even to the point where it's uncomfortable, save until it's at least a little bit uncomfortable is something I like to say. That's how you're going to get to enjoy the abundance mindset in the future. That is fascinating. I've never heard it put that way before to actually create a little bit of scarcity within yourself. But it's not real scarcity because you're sort of manufacturing it so that you can be set up for your abundance later. Yeah, there is kind of a little mental trick where even though the money's not gone, if you don't see it at the bank and you're only checking in maybe once a month when you get your statements for your investment accounts, it does a really great thing to be able to save a little bit incrementally month over month over month and then you watch it stack up over time. And at the same time, you know, it's not just getting spent in regular lifestyle expenses. Oh, yeah. I think that's one of the biggest changes I've made since leaving my corporate job. And it really was not just as a result of not making the same income. It was more of a result of those things didn't matter to me anymore. The purses, the Ferragamo shoes, going out and buying the latest and greatest thing. I'm like, I don't need any of that stuff. That's not ever that stuff never actually brought me joy. It really was me trying to put on a facade and impress other people. And once I understood that about myself and I could get honest with myself, it just gave me so much freedom. And now I get to shop at like thrift shops and stuff. And I don't care. I'm like, that's great. Somebody else wore this top. 
probably 20 times before I got it. Whatevs. It's cute. It's a fraction of the cost and it's sustainable. So yeah, like, you know, but it just gives you so much power when you have that mindset shift about things. Yeah. When you pay yourself first, you get a little bit more mindful about what's worth spending on yourself, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so somebody's thinking about leaving corporate and there's all these different kinds of accounts that they can have. There's 401ks, non-qualified accounts. Can you just like help us map out the difference, the types of accounts we should be considering? Because I think this gets super confusing real fast. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot and there's a lot of crazy terminology in our industry too. So I'm just going to do kind of a boring academic breakdown of some of the different types of accounts. Yes, please. Yeah. So real basic, a lot of companies, especially large corporations, they're going to offer you a 401k. And there's two different kinds of 401k. There's a traditional 401k and then there's a Roth 401k. And in a traditional 401k, you defer some of your income now and maybe you get a match from your employer. And that goes into an account that you can't touch until you turn 59 and a half. And then after you reach that point, when you start taking money out of that account, it gets taxed as ordinary income then in retirement. So you're getting a tax break now by not recognizing whatever amount of income you defer. But then you're basically assuming that you're going to be in a lower income tax bracket in your retirement and you're paying the taxes on it then. In a Roth 401k, you don't get any tax benefits today, but you'd still go ahead and you put the money in the account. Maybe you get the employer match. And then when you turn 59 and a half and the money becomes penalty free for access, you withdraw it and you don't pay taxes on it ever again. So that money grows from now until the time when you can take it out tax free and then it's tax free forever. So those are the really basic ones. But I know a lot of your clients are in higher level roles and you use the term golden handcuffs earlier. So there's some other kind of, they're called non-ERISA plans, which means they're regulated differently. So these are plans that employers will put in place to keep key employees to incentivize them to stay longer. So some examples are like non-qualified deferred compensation plans, which can have, they'll have very different terms just depending on what your employer offers you. It's basically a handshake agreement where they say, well, you have to stay here for X number of years and then we're going to pay you X amount of dollars over X amount of time when you leave. They can be really appealing. I've also seen similar arrangements funded with life insurance. But yeah, once you start getting into the non-ERISA plans, there's just there's a huge amount of variety out there. So it's really important to take time and understand what kinds of benefits and stuff that you have through your corporate job when you're starting to track for your exit. So you need to understand what's the vesting that I have? You know, what do I get to take with me? What am I leaving on the table if I go? But before you spend too much time getting hung up on what you might be leaving behind, just know that there's a lot of these retirement arrangements that you can create for yourself as a business owner. So you can still get a lot of the benefits, the tax benefits of setting up retirement plans on your own. And you have a path to financial freedom because you're not bound by someone else's contract for how much you can make. You know, you're your own limitation at that point. Yes, 100 percent. And some people are like, oh, I can't leave this corporate income I have. And I'm like, you could double that with your own business. <laughs> it's like- Oh, now is everybody going to do that? No, right? There's a lot of factors that go into that and making sure that you've got a good business model and you're charging properly and all that kind of stuff. But we can, I can help you with that, right? We can figure all that out. But it's just really understanding, like you said, it might even be more of a timing issue. Okay, I'm going to get X amount if I leave this. So I'm going to, I can hang in there another three months. I'm going to wait and hit that milestone, get that chunk of cash, and then I can go. But what I know for sure is that at some point, if you really are that unhappy, the money doesn't even matter. Because I had a client probably three months ago. She was like, I can't go. I've got 80 some thousand dollars coming to me in two years. I got to hang in there for this. And I'm like, 
all right. Like I, I get it. 80,000 isn't like a 10 K bot, right? Like it's that's junk. I'm like, okay, whatever you want to do. Then she comes to me a couple months later, crying her eyes out. This is, I'm totally miserable. She's like, I don't even care about the money. They can keep these stupid stocks and the, this and that and whatever. She's like, just get me out. My marriage is in shambles. I'm not the parent I wanted to be, right? All She's just listing all the things. And I'm like, yes, you finally see that. But sometimes you have to experience it. You can't yeah. just listen to Karen say, well, the money's really not that important. Sometimes you have to kind of hit that rock bottom or have that moment where you go, oh, she was right. She was right. And then we can <laughs> work through it. Yeah. And that goes back to where, you know, the kind of coaching process helps you figure out what motivates you and that can help kind of chart a course for how you need to move next. Yeah, for sure. You know, and I definitely always recommend when I'm working with my clients that they see a financial expert. And I've heard these two terms, financial advisor, financial planner. How do I know which one is the best for me, for my clients? Can you just break down the difference a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So financial planner is not a regulated term. There's people who do financial plans who, let's say they just, like I described earlier, maybe they do a budget plan for you or they do budget coaching. That's just mm -hmm. a generic term for someone who is providing general advice about your finances. Uh, the term investment advisor is regulated. And so there's requirements that you have to meet testing and experience and so on. But to be an investment advisor, that is someone who is allowed to charge money in exchange for giving investment and financial advice. And then the third one that I'll throw in, since I mentioned it in my introduction, is the certified financial planner designation, which is handed out by the CFP board. And it's kind of considered the gold standard for financial planners. It's a really long process. There's a lot of education and experience that goes into it. There's a really hard test. There's a ton of continuing education requirements. Um, but that's someone who's going to be a one-stop shop for all of your planning and investment advisory needs, typically. Yeah, that is so helpful. And I feel like in the era of coaching, you know, it's great because the barrier to entry is so low and people with a heart to help and serve other people can get into business very easily. But there's a lot of people out there calling themselves financial coaches and they may not have the level of expertise that someone like, well, they definitely won't have the type of expertise that you have. So, you know, not all financial advisors and planners are going to be created equal. And I think that's really helpful just to understand the ecosystem so we can make educated decisions and do our due diligence to make sure we're with the person who's going to best serve our needs for that. Yeah, it's good to understand whatever limitations that an advisor you're looking to work with might have. So that don't mean that in a negative way. Right. And make sure you have a little bit of an idea of what you're going to need from them and make sure that they're going to be able to provide those services to you. Totally. In a compliant like way. <laughs> yeah, that would be key, right? Let's make sure we're doing this by the book. Yep. Okay. So knowing the difference then between the advisor and the planner status, how do you help people with questions about money and help them, you know, grow their wealth? Yeah. It's about taking what's a pretty technical area of life and bringing the human element into it. So it's asking the right questions. It's alleviating uncertainties or doubts that a client might have, whether it's about investing or planning in general or college funding, that kind of stuff. We're here to help with that. And then sometimes clients will come and they don't have very clearly defined goals. So they'll say, well, I do want to retire at some point. But part of our process too is helping you define those goals. Are you retiring at 55 in a town or state different from the one you live in now? Are you retiring at 65 and staying in your home? Are you selling your home and traveling abroad for the rest of your retirement years? We like to really sit down and get to know our clients and make sure that we're coming up with solutions for actually achievable goals. I love that you brought that up. And I think that's one of the hardest things I've had is really articulating with my financial planner or advisor, I guess he is, about 
exactly what I want my retirement to look like because I go back and forth. I'm like, I don't, I don't know where my kids are going to be. What if I want to be near them? Or, or what if I decide I want to get some land? Or what if something changes with my health? And then like, oh my gosh, I don't want to manage all this land. I might just want like a condo at the beach. And so I'm like, I don't know. So it is hard sometimes, I think, to think that far forward and get a really clear picture. Yeah. And you saying, what is this? What is that? And it's really funny because I literally call it the what is game. So when clients sit down and they're like, what if I want to do this? What if I want to do that? Part of what I do is, you know, I use financial planning software to model all of these different hypothetical scenarios for you. So I can try as much as I can to answer the what if. Right. To give you an idea of what's feasible and what it could look like for you financially. I love that. Ah, oh, yes. It's like it takes all the guesswork out of it. There's no more what ifs. Like you're just like, oh, if that, then this. Right. It's like perfect. There's some highly educated guesswork because True. we're still <laughs> operating in a world of assumption, but yeah. it is a little bit of a clearer picture. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's fair. Thanks for clarifying that. I'm like, Anna will know your future. She's like, no, no don't please don't I, say it. <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball. Sorry, everybody. It's okay. We wish you did, but that's all right. Okay. I saw a stat recently too, and I wish I had put where I saw this, but it was online. It was on somebody's website. And it said that people who have an advisor can 2X their returns, but only 35% of people actually have an advisor. So where is the disconnect? I mean, the data is just telling me get an advisor. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I if you ever figure out where you did find that stat, I would love to get the source for it. But, you know, I think people are maybe intimidated by coming to an advisor. Maybe they feel a little bit of shame about maybe being behind the curve or they're not really sure what to expect in a planning meeting. But, you know, we're here to help. That's our number one goal is to help people. So whether it's education or just kind of taking that mental load away from you completely, you know, that's what we're here to do. You don't get far in life. And you know this working with your clients, doing what everybody else is doing. Huh. Yes. So, Say it again for the people in the back. <laughs> you won't get far in life doing what everybody else is doing. So it sounds like 35% of people, the ones who are working with advisors, they're different. They're doing something different. And that's that they're going to someone who's going to help them implement a disciplined approach to saving and investing. Take some of the emotional labor out of that process and really just apply a slow and steady approach to making sure that investments happen at the right time and in the right place. Yeah, such great advice. Thank you for that. And as someone now, hopefully we've painted the picture that y'all need to get an advisor, right? Like now is the time, call Anna. But when someone is trying to figure out who to pick, aside from, you know, we want to have somebody in the holistic, you know, it's going to look at the full picture. I mean, like what else should we be considering when we're choosing someone? Yeah, personality is key. I mean, like I said, we want to work with people like us and I'm sure you want to work with someone who's like you. So I help a whole spectrum of clients with lots of different things. But at the end of the day, you have to click with that person. You have to like the way that they explain things. You have to feel seen and heard in your interactions with them. And you don't want to be scared to talk to them or ask them questions. It should be like a mentor. Right. Yes. And if you get somebody who doesn't treat you with the kind of respect that you feel you need to be treated with, run. Like, I remember my parents telling me a story about they sat down with a potential advisor and he was like rude. They had just moved to a new location. And the guy was like, I don't even know why you live here. There's all they get, like just being really negative about the location. And then basically it was like, you don't even have enough money to make it worth my time. And, you know, I think about my parents, like they did well. So I don't know what this guy thought he was going to be managing as a financial advisor, but they just were like, okay, we're taking our money somewhere else because they had such a bad experience in that initial meeting. So don't be afraid to just thank the person for their time and bow out. If you have a feeling in your gut and it's not the right fit, this is not who you want to become BFFs with when it comes to your money. 
Yeah. And if that person is pressuring you to sign paperwork in your very first meeting and you still have questions that aren't answered, like take up more of their time. You know, make sure you're really sure that that's the person that you want to work with. We see a lot of high pressure tactics in our industry. And, you know, if you haven't discussed ahead of time on the phone, like, hey, I know I'm coming to you and I want to get accounts open and start working on some of that stuff. You don't have to sign anything that day. Yeah. For sure. It was so funny because, and this might not be everybody's approach and that's fine, but it worked with me. My financial planner was like, go home and pray about it. And I was like, wait, yeah. what? I was like, you don't want me to write, like, do you want me to sign something? Like, are we, are we doing this? And he's like, I want you to go home and pray about it. And I was like, okay, like I'm fine with praying about it, but I just I was like, that's such an interesting approach to business. And it made me want to work with him even more because he took that, like, I'm here if you need me. If you want to do this, great. I can help you, but I'm not going to pressure you into that. And that was like sealed the deal for me. And that's a great advisor. Yeah. We've had a good experience so far. Good. But he's getting older, so I'm going to call you if he kicks the bucket. <laughs> well, well, that's true. It's true. I can't the, wait. People, the, this industry is rapidly aging a lot of mm-hmm. people who are working in this field and it's very male and it's very white yeah so i mean i am a white woman but i see more and more women coming into this field and into this industry and i see more and more male clients who don't bat an eyelash they never say oh i wish a man was working on this for me i think we i think we bring something a little bit different to the table especially with compassion and understanding and listening skills. Yeah, that's our superpower, right? Like we can mm-hmm. bring that to the table and it will be appreciated. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm so glad you shared that. I love that. Yeah. The future is female. Woo-hoo! <laughs> yes. Well, it wouldn't be Rock Your Reinvention if I didn't ask my signature question. And that is, if you could say one thing to the woman listening who knows they want to make a change in life, but they don't know how to get started, what would you say? I say, don't be afraid to ask for help. Mm. It's okay to start small, Mm -hmm. but like this isn't something that you want to figure out by yourself. Like we said, it's one of the most emotionally charged aspects of your life that is fundamental in making sure you can do what you want to do with your life, have the tools you need to reach your goals. So if you or, you know, someone in your household has ever been charged with buying groceries, but they don't have a list, what happens? They come home and they're like, well, I have some orange juice and I have some eggs and I have a bag of chips. (laughs) Like what happened? Well, you didn't have a plan when you went in. So don't be afraid to ask for help getting a plan put together. and. It's okay to be bold. It's okay to want to seek wealth. It's okay to be loud and present as a woman in whatever professional space you occupy because you belong there. Yes. Yes to all of that. And, you know, one of my bold financial goals has been to be able to donate $30,000 a year. I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. And I'm also including my time in that at the moment. Like, that's kind of how I'm getting closer to that goal because, you know, time is money. But eventually Mm -hmm. I want to be in a position where I'm writing checks of up to $30,000, right? And not all at once, but in different places. And just that is my my goal to give back. So, you know, God willing, we'll get there. We'll see. Oh, man, I'm caring for you. I hope you get to do that. I know you will. What am I saying? I know you will. (laughs) Thank you. I know I am. I'm already doing it. (laughs) Got to have that mindset. All right. So now that everyone is like, okay, I know I need to look in my finances. I need help. I got to call Anna. How do they find you? Where do they go to get your info and connect with you? Yes. Um, You can email me at Anna at parallelfinancial.com. And parallelfinancial.com is our company website where you can learn more about our different offices here in the upstate of South Carolina, some of the other advisors in our firm. Maybe I'm not quite your cup of tea, but you're like, "Mm." This sound like a nice company. Maybe there's someone else there I'd click with better. You can call my direct line at 864-375-4024 or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Awesome. I love it. I'll make sure all of that is in the show notes too. So you can just click right there to get into her profile or send her an email and you'll be ready to rock and roll and get your money in order so you can finally rock your reinvention. 
thank you again, Anna, for being here today. As always, you're dropping amazing knowledge on us. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Kara. And I really hope your listeners enjoyed this today. I know they did. Thank you. And everybody, until next time, stay fabulous. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you're inspired to take action by committing to one of the tips or strategies we talked about in today's episode. If you want more accountability and support, I've got your back. Book a complimentary Empowered Exit Strategy call today. Visit karenfreeland.com to learn more and book your 45-minute session. Until next time, stay fabulous.